So this morning, we're going to be continuing our study of Jonah. And I don't know about you, but that feels a little weird to me, doesn't it? Like, shouldn't the story be over? I mean, God gave Jonah a job to do. Jonah did the job, and the Ninevites avoided their wrath, right? Shouldn't we just have the fireworks going off and the happy ending, and we all just kind of drift off, and now we move on to the book of Micah? I mean, yeah, I get the Ninevites' repentance was questionable at best, and we didn't actually see them come to faith necessarily, but at least we got to marvel at how merciful our great God is, and we got to see how he treats those who humble themselves before him. Jonah completed his mission. The Ninevites humbled themselves, and God was merciful. I mean, that's a nice story with some good lessons. But then we find ourselves confronted here with Jonah 4. Why is Jonah 4 here? What more needs to be said in this story? Well, actually quite a bit. I know that Jonah 4 might feel like the epilogue. It might feel like the after story or something kind of tacked on to the main story. Because in Jonah, what, we, what do we care about? It's that fish. We care about the big fish, right? What does Jonah 4 have to do with the big fish? And yet, I would argue that Jonah 4 is really where we start to see the true meaning of the book of Jonah come together. Where we get to encounter what God would teach us through Jonah. And so we're going to be in Jonah 4, 1 through 4 this morning. And so I'll be reading from the ESV version of the Bible. But if you could stand with me to honor God's word as I read for us Jonah 4, 1 through 4. It says this, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? You could be seated. Now, right at the start of Jonah 4, we right away can see something seems a bit off here. The after story isn't the happy ending that we had really hoped for. We don't see Jonah and the newly forgiven Ninevites sitting around a campfire singing Kumbaya. Instead, what we see is we see Jonah, and he's alone, and he's, he's angry. I mean, think about this. If, if we saw a kind of passive-aggressive Jonah in Jonah 1... Now we've got all-out confrontation drone here in Jonah 4. I mean, I kind of thought of it this way, as I've gotten to know the Midwest a little better. Think of Jonah 1 like an angry Midwesterner, right? An angry Midwesterner, they're confronted with something they don't want to do, and so they're not going to argue back with God. What are they going to do? They're just going to run away, right? That's what a good old angry Midwesterner will do. But how many of you grew up on the East or West Coast? Do I have any East or West Coast people here? Does it work like that out there? No, sir. No, see, Jonah 4 is like those East and West Coast people. This is where Jonah's going to tell God exactly what he thinks. And so, what's going on here? Where, where's the happy ending that we were hoping for? Well, let's honest, it's gotten a bit muddled because our prophet doesn't appear to like the outcome from his journey. And so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through our text today, and I want you to consider with me three different elements of our text that show us a little bit more about Jonah, but more than anything, teach us about God. The first thing we see in our text is we see Jonah's misplaced anger. We see Jonah's misplaced anger. Jonah 4.1 says this, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. That term displeased Jonah exceedingly, it actually can also be translated from the Hebrew this way. It was exceedingly evil to Jonah. It was exceedingly evil to Jonah. Now, that leads us to the question, what what was so evil? What was so terrible to displease Jonah? It says it. What is it? Well, the it here refers us back, it appears, to God's relenting of disaster in verse 10, right? So if you go back to chapter 3, verse 10, many people believe this is what the it possibly refers to. 
When God saw what they, the Ninevites, did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So some people think that's the it. But I think there's a little bit more to the it than that. Because, I mean, is Jonah really sadistic enough to be upset that God didn't rain down fire on this, this, these people? I mean, and maybe Jonah is. But I think it's more likely that the it here that Jonah's referring to is the entire chain of events that's taken place over our book. Dr. John Walton, professor in biblical studies, he says this, Jonah is angry that the whole process is taking place. He will not be able to convert the Assyrians to a monotheistic belief in the Lord and has not been instructed to do so. But then why should they be spared for such a superficial ritual? And for that matter, why should they even be warned? I mean, think about Jonah's perspective. The, the Ninevites, they didn't deserve your grace, God. They didn't deserve your mercy. They have no interest in actually turning in faith to you. They just completed a ritual and you spared them? I mean... What is going on, God? Why would you do that? Why would you send me for this task? And so here is Jonah sitting back and kind of reflecting on his journey through the book of Jonah. And he, it makes him angry, quite angry. He had to leave his comfort. He had to go somewhere he didn't want to go. And he had to share a message that he didn't want to share. And he had to share it with a people that he didn't want to share it with. And so as he reflects over all of these facts that's transpired during his time, it makes him upset. Not totally unlike us when life doesn't go the way that we want it to. You see, we can look a lot like Jonah when we think we deserve that promotion at work that that other person got that you work harder than them, right? You know, they just kind of ride your coattails, but they got promoted and you didn't. Or we can have the same kind of anger as we reflect over a tragic event that's happened in our lives or lives of a loved one. Or we may feel that God is taking us down a path we don't want to go, and that can make us angry. But there's one problem. The fact is that your anger with God, Jonah's anger with God, is always misplaced. It's always misplaced. Because Jonah here, and so much you and I, we miss one thing. We miss this one thing, and when we miss this one thing, it leads us down some very dangerous paths, and it's simply this. God is God. I am not. God is God. You are not. We are not. Jonah is not. To be made in the image of God is truly a glorious thing, but it doesn't qualify us for the job title of God of the universe. The truth is that you and I would really make a lousy God. I know for some of you that's hard to hear this morning, but you, you wouldn't be a great guy. I know maybe sometimes you think, you know what? I'm a pretty good person. I feel like I'm fair, and I'm, I'm just, and I'm, I'm kind, and I'm gracious, and I'm no. No, 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 no. You being God would be a terrible thing. You wouldn't do those things. Man, I doubt mankind would last the day if you or I were put in charge just wouldn't happen. We were never meant to be God. We were never meant to play God. But when something happens in life that is different than our plans or what we want or what we think would be best, we think we know better. And that can make us angry. God, don't you know better than to allow this? God, why don't you follow my plans? My plans are good. This would be ultimately good. They're so much better than what you have me walking through right now. God, if you're so good, then why are you letting this happen to me? And in our place of judgment, sitting on our pretend little throne while we judge the high king of heaven and what he is doing in our lives and in the universe, we start to grow angry. We grow angry with God because we think we know better than God. We think our plans would be superior to his. We think he did the wrong thing. But church, hear me this morning. We do not know better than God. 
as hard as it is to imagine. Whatever made up plans that you have, they will never ever be better than God and what he is doing. Romans 9.20 hits us with some of this reality. Romans 9.20 says this. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? This is a hard truth for us to swallow. We like to think we're a little bit more important than maybe we actually are, but the fact is, church, you, you and I, we're clay. God has molded us for his purposes and plans. Who are we to argue back with our creator? Who, who are we to think that we somehow have a voice before God of the universe? I mean, my kids love to play with Legos, and I don't see their Legos arguing back with them, Right? The little guy that's supposed to be an astronaut, my son likes to turn him into a ninja or a fighter guy. I don't see him say, I'm supposed to be an astronaut. (laughs) He doesn't argue back. In a sense, the Lego knows its place. But you and I forget that. It's a question that that we have to ponder. Church, we, we see such a small thread of the majestic tapestry called time. And yet we grow angry because in our limited view... God somehow messed up. He didn't do what was right in our opinion. Is our anger justified? Is it right for us to be angry with God? Well, that's a question that was once asked to Pastor Alistair Begg. He was asked, is it ever right for a Christian to be angry with God? Is it ever right for a Christian to be angry with God? I like what he says. This is what he said. And my answer was that it is understandable that the Christian pilgrim would be angry with God but I don't believe it's actually ever right. So while it's understandable, it's not right. Yes, there are situations in life where God is going to do something that you don't understand or agree with. That will happen. Where he will either not do something you think he should do, or he will do something that you're like, God, why are you doing this? But this is a call for us to realize our place. He is the God of all. He is the maker and sustainer of all things. You and I are but a blip on the timeline. We need to recognize God's sovereignty, but also that he is good. And that even though what we're going through is hard, he ultimately has good things in store for whatever that is. This is a call for us to remember our place in life. I love Job. Job is such a difficult book for us to study. In Job 1, we find that Job has just suffered immense loss. He's lost family. He's lost possessions. He's lost almost everything. And look how Job responds. Job 1, 20 through 22, this is what Job does. Then Job arose, and he tore his robe, and he shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. He worshiped. And this is what he said. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. I pray that would be your heart. This isn't easy. This isn't something that we do naturally. But I pray that you would respond to God as Job did and not as Jonah did. You see, Jonah's anger arose because he didn't like all that had happened. He didn't like the commands, the boat, the storm, the fish, the preaching, the repentance, God's mercy to these undeserving Ninevites. He didn't like the path that God had led him on. But Jonah's anger was misplaced because he forgot that he is but clay. God is God. I am not. It is understandable that we may grow angry at God when life throws us things we don't want, but it's never right. It's never justified. Jonah forgot that. And that leads us to our second point. Because Jonah was angry with God, Jonah responds by uttering a very selfish, hypocritical prayer. The second thing we see in our text is Jonah's selfish, hypocritical prayer. It's really interesting. The whole book of Jonah, we only see the words Jonah prayed two times. The first time is in Jonah 2 from the belly of the fish, and now here in Jonah 4. And the author of Jonah does not want us to miss this connection irony. 
He wants us to see clearly there's a difference in these two prayers of Jonah. And so we're going to look at the two parts of the prayer here in Jonah 4. And as we do that, I want you to really think back. Try to remember that prayer from Jonah 2. And think how differently Jonah prays now based on the circumstance he's in. In the first part of Jonah's prayer here in Jonah 4, we see that Jonah's going to justify his flight from God. That's the first thing he's going to do. Look with me with verse 2. And Jonah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Notice in that verse the word knew. It's the verb knew. It sticks out like a sore thumb in that verse and in the entire book. Now, I used to be an English teacher back in the day. I know that's hard to believe as you listen to me or read my emails. But one thing I had to remind my students of frequently is verb tense matters. The verb in our text is the verb knew. It's not the verb know. It's not like, hey, God, after everything I have gone through, after this whole journey that you've put me through, I now know that you are gracious and merciful. No, the verb is knew. As in Jonah knew these facts about God. When did Jonah know these facts? Well, our text leads us to believe that even before God asked him to go to Nineveh, Jonah knew. He knew these truths about God. Well, what did Jonah know? Well, again, look with me again in verse 2. He knew that God is gracious and merciful. He knew that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He knew that God relents from disaster. Jonah knew these facts about God even before Jonah 1 took place. He knew these things, but did he know these things? Do you know what I mean? Like you can know something, but do you know it really? Let me give you an example. I'm going to tell you a minute about a guy named Mike. Mike is from Eagle Point, Oregon. About 10 years ago, he went to Southern Oregon University. Mike's married with two kids, and he served in the military for three years in the late 80s. Mike loves to hike and fish in his free time. I know a lot of facts about Mike. I do not know Mike. I've never met Mike. I have no idea really who he is. He's just a friend of one of my high school friends on Facebook. That's all he is. I can know facts about something without really knowing that thing. See, Jonah knew that God was gracious and merciful. He knew God was slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. But it appears that these were just facts Jonah knew. Or he, he knew kind of what this meant. It doesn't seem like Jonah really understood, deeply understood the depth of what God's grace and mercy are. What you think about, it's kind of odd. Because here we get to Jonah 4, you think Jonah should have learned something, right? I think Jonah should have kind of known better at this point. He should have known better. I mean, go back and look at Jonah 2 with me. You'll see words like this in Jonah 2. Jonah praying to God, you brought me up from the pit, God. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Doesn't that sound like someone who kind of gets it? And yet here in Jonah 4, we see he clearly doesn't. The reality of God's grace and mercy being for more than himself seems a little bit lost on Jonah. Did Jonah really know that God is gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love? Doesn't appear so. Pray that your heart not be like Jonah's. You see, it's easy for us to know facts about God. We read our Bibles, we come to church, and we start to put together, okay, God is love, God is good, God is gracious. We, we know these facts about God, but do you really know these truths about God? Do you know his grace and mercy? Do you know his steadfast love? Do you know that all of these things are not just for you? They're for you and for others. And because of Jonah's misunderstanding, because Jonah didn't understand these things, he hadn't experientially beheld these truths of God as something to hold up as a glorious thing for himself and others, we come to verse 3, and Jonah makes an emotional and foolish request. Look at verse 3 with me. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. 
Jonah's anger and hatred for these people not only led them to a foolish decision to run from God, but now has led him to a foolish request for God to take his life from him. I mean, this feels a little bit overkill, doesn't it? A little bit extreme here. Jonah wants God to take his life just because God led him on this crazy journey, and in the end, his enemies were spared? I mean, I get Job making the request. I get Job saying, hey, take my life from me, man. He went through some darkness. But Jonah's coming off a lot more like a spoiled, pouty little child here. I didn't get my way. I'm throwing the table over and saying, I give up. I don't want this anymore. Why would Jonah say this? Why would he make such an extreme request? Well, one commentary I read, they said this, the prophet petitioned God to take his life because he felt he had lost his credibility with the Jews by preaching to their enemy. To Jonah, his reputation was more important than compassion on those that are perishing in their sin. He was outwardly obedient while harboring inward rebellion. Jonah would rather die than have his reputation tarnished. He would rather lose his life than see sinners saved. But I want you to notice that last line of the quote I just read. It said that Jonah was outwardly obedient while harboring inward rebellion. He was outwardly obedient while harboring inward rebellion. That one hurts a little bit, doesn't it? I mean, wait, you mean that my outward obedience is not all that God cares about? I thought that's what Christians were all about, right? We just got to have this outward obedience. We have to look like those really holy people, and then we can call ourselves Christians. No, that's not the case. And this is exactly why God cares so much about your heart, not just your obedience. Because when we harbor inward rebellion towards God, what's going to happen is you will drift. You can keep up the outward obedience for a time, but it will start to wear down because of your rebellion. I mean, think about your life. Maybe God didn't do what you asked him to do, or maybe that he has led you down a path that you did not want to go on. And in that space, you did the good old Christian thing. You put on that fake smile, you forced your obedience, and then you said some of those very famous Christian platitudes, things like, you know what? When God closes a door, he opens a window. (laughs) Or, you know what? God won't give me more than I can handle. Or how about one of my favorites? God helps those who help themselves. Church, what in the world are we doing? Why do these things even exist? None of them are in the Bible, in case you weren't sure. When God closes a door, guess what? Sometimes he doesn't open a window. God will most certainly give you more than you can handle, so you have to depend upon him. And God absolutely does not help those who help themselves. God helps those who humbly depend upon him. God, you may be the most obedient person at church this morning here, but if in your heart you are rebellious towards God, you are angry, you are festering bitter at what God did or didn't do in your life, it's going to come out at some point. You can only fake it for so long before eventually it breaks you down. In Matthew 15, 8 to 9, Jesus here, he's quoting the prophet Isaiah. He says this, This people, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's Jonah. That's Jonah right here. Jonah 4 is the result of outward obedience with a heart that is far from God. This is, a, this is the fruit of the grin and bear it mentality. The pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just go, this is the result of it. It's Jonah 4. What if instead of faking the smile, preaching some quasi-gospel platitudes at yourself while you burn with anger within it what God has done or not done, what if instead you took that hurt All those misunderstandings, all those pains, all those questions, you took them to God. What if instead of burning with anger, you were honest with him about how you feel? But then you recognize your place and say, God, I don't get this. I don't want this. But your will be done. But 
God, may your, your grace cover me because I can't walk through this on my own. God, give me the peace I need as my life feels like turmoil going on. Give me your provision to endure this because I want to give up. Jonah didn't do that. He just got angry. And because of that misplaced anger, Jonah made a very foolish, foolish request of God. And so now the question we come to in our text is, how is God going to respond? We see Jonah get angry and make this foolish request. How is God going to respond to him? His reluctant prophet is now on this emotional tirade against his master. Well, that's where we come to Jonah 4.4. And I'm going to read for you Jonah 4.4, the NRV version. I don't know if you know the NRV version. I'll have it up here. It says, And God appointed a great lion to devour Jonah. And the story's over. <laughs> no, that's what we wish it says, right? I mean, all right, Jonah, you got off that one time. The big fish, that was nice. But now, God, just, just get, get the lion. Get the lion. Get rid of Jonah. Let's move on because he is such a headache. This is, again, if you and I were God, people would be in big trouble. But thankfully, we don't read from the NRV version. Instead, Jonah 4.4, we see that God is, again, compassionate. He's compassionate. Look at 4.4 with me. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? In spite of Jonah's misguided anger and selfish prayer, God does what God has done, does, and he will always do. God shows compassion. He shows compassion to Jonah. I love how this story here, especially in Jonah 4, so beautifully mirrors what Jesus teaches in Luke 15. In Luke 15, we have the story of the prodigal son. And for those of you that don't know the story, I'll give you kind of a quick background on it. Jesus tells this parable or story about a father with two sons. And the younger son is wayward and rebellious. He tells his father, give me my share of the inheritance. And he goes far away and he squanders his money on selfish, sinful living. Yet the older son stays. He faithfully serves his father and takes care of him at home. Well, over time, the younger son realizes his foolishness and returns to the father repentant, saying, Father, forgive me, I, I messed up. And in that space, the, the father comes out to the son and embraces him, shows him compassion and grace, even though he has messed up so greatly. But what about that older son? What happens with him? Well, look with me at Luke 15. Luke 15, 25 through 32. This is now the older son. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he was received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and treated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and now is found. You see, the older brother gets angry that his father would show the younger brother compassion. Doesn't that so feel like Jonah 4 here? Doesn't this just so beautifully mirror what we see in Jonah 4? And I think this is an important lesson. I think this is why Jonah 4 is here. Because I think for a lot of us that have been around church for a long time, this story maybe hits us a little closer to home than we would like to admit. Because I think a lot of us, we can find our lives can tend to be more like Jonah or the older brother. Right? We don't have that crazy testimony. We haven't lived a wayward, wicked life. We haven't veered too far from good Christian behavior our entire life. But maybe as we look, we realize we're not as compassionate to those people. We're not as compassionate to the younger brothers, the Ninevites, the people who didn't follow God. Do we have compassion for those people, church? What about for that relative 
who grew up in church, but man, oh man, they've gone way, way far away from that theology. Or maybe that person that you were friends with growing up, you know, you guys were good friends, maybe even did a wanna together, but their worldview today is so completely different than yours, you wouldn't even be able, know where to start with a gospel conversation. Or what about that person that you right now would think of as an enemy, someone that's against you and your Christian faith? Does God have compassion for those people too, or just for you? And this is where the compassion of God actually shines most brightly, so much more than our own skewed compassion. Because God has compassion for those wayward people, for the older, sorry, for the Ninevites, the younger brother, those people with the crazy testimonies. God has compassion for them. But lest we forget, God also has compassion for the self-righteous. He does. He has it for Jonah. He has it for the older brother. He has it for those people that have been in church their whole life and have never even interacted with someone from outside these walls. While the wayward may not want the grace of God, and the self-righteous may not feel like they need the grace of God, God still has compassion for both of them. That is the compassion of our great God. He extends compassion to Nineveh, and he extends it to Jonah. And this is an important lesson. We need to remember this this morning, church. If you call yourself Christian here today, God, in great compassion, saved you. You didn't save yourself. God either saved you from a life of wayward living, wicked and rebellious against anything to do with God, or God saved you from your own self-righteousness. You're a pretty good person. You followed the rules. And so a question I want you to ponder this week is this. What did God save you from? What did God save you from? Were you that person that kept all the rules and so God had to save you from saving yourself? Or were you that person running as far away from God as possible and God came running after you? Either way, God came for you. I think we need to remind ourselves of this because we can start to believe the lie that we weren't really saved from anything. We just became a Christian because God looked at us and thought, you know, yeah, hey, they're a Christian. I mean, look at them. They're a good person. It's so funny because uh, it just reminded me of, I, I often have talks with people about prayer. And one thing that comes up often when people are talking about prayer is confession. What does it mean to confess? And so I remember when I worked at the university, I'd often talk with university students, and they would tell me things like this. You know what? I, I'm getting this prayer thing down, but I, I just don't know how to confess. I go, oh, really? I go, yeah, I, I didn't do anything bad today to confess. Really? You, you can't think of one thing you did today where you completely disregarded the high king of heaven? And so I just sit them down and I go, here's my list. Selfishness, careless words, wrong motivations, apathy, pride, wrong pursuits. You name it, I pray about it because I am sinful. I could fill a whole day with confession. And that's not because I'm super jacked up. It's because as God continues to work the rough edges off my life, he graciously shows me other places that need work. This is why we remember who we are and where we've come from, and we remember the compassion that God has for us, church. Do you realize how compassionate God has been to you? Will you praise him this week for that undeserved compassion? I want to close today with two challenges. And the first is what we see from Jonah 4.4. Do we do well to be angry? Do we do well to be angry? Just as God asked Jonah, I think we need to examine our hearts for anger that we may have towards others or anger that we may have towards God that's preventing us from sharing his compassion. Because when you're angry with God, if there's some unresolved conflict that you have towards God, I promise you, you're not going to be compassionate to people out there. Matthew Henry, on this verse, he said this, Do we do well to be angry at that which is for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom? Let the conversion of sinners, which is the joy of heaven, be our joy and never our grief. That is our desire, church. Is there some inward rebellion that you have towards your maker? Think about it. Are you angry at God for something he did or didn't do? Do you do well to be angry? Are you justified in being angry at God? Because I'm going to agree with Pastor Alistair Begg it's understandable you're going to go through seasons where you're going to misunderstand and be angry with God. 
but it's not justified. It's not right. Instead of festering, instead of just being angry with God, take your anger to Him. Don't let it fester any longer. His compassion is enough even for you in your anger and rebellion. If you need help with that this week, if you recognize you've got some pent-up anger towards God, please talk to myself and one of the elders here. We would love to sit down with you and just help you work through that. Because again, as we see in our text today, God's got compassion for you. He's got compassion for you. So much better than what you're doing right now. Don't be like Jonah. Learn from his mistakes. God's grace is big enough to help you work through whatever God has not done or done that you don't understand. But the second thing is I want to recommend a book to you on this topic. It's this book right here called Prodigal God by Timothy Keller. It's a great little book. You can buy it, find it used. It'll be super cheap. Google Prodigal God used. You can find it super cheap. I recommend buying it. It showcases the incredible compassion of God to both the wayward and the self-righteous. And I actually have a few copies to give out this week. But I have a limited amount. And so I'm going to offer them to our new people. If you fill out a connect card, see what I did there, and drop it in the box at the back, next week you show up, boom, you get a free book, all right? Those of you that can't do that, please talk to me. I'll help you find one, okay? But I've only got a few copies, so I just want to make sure we reserve those for our guests this week. Above all else today, our text reminds us that we worship a very compassionate God. Please don't forget that. He gave the wayward Ninevites mercy that they did not deserve in Jonah 3. They did not deserve it, yet he shared it with them. But in Jonah 4, what we see is a beautiful picture of God extending mercy to a very self-righteous prophet who did not deserve his mercy either. Whether it be the wayward or the self-righteous, God's grace and mercy are more than enough to satisfy you and wherever you're at. You see, the truth is this. Jesus made a way. He made a way for you to experience this compassion at great cost to himself. So church, hear me, please don't take that for granted. Don't take Jesus' sacrifice for granted. Live in the compassion of God. Bask in the compassion of God. Derive much joy knowing that you are reconciled to your creator because of his compassion and sending Christ to die in your place. Don't be angry towards God. I don't know what he did or didn't do in your life. I'm just telling you that anger is not going to get you anywhere. Don't put on that fake smile any longer and play the part of good churchgoer. Our God's compassionate. Take the hurt to him. Take the anger to him. Take the misunderstanding to him. Run to him, and he will come and give you compassion. His compassion is more than enough for whatever you've been through and whatever you will face. Trust in that this week.